all CEOs, me included, we don't actually know what we're doing. They're all sharks, so all you got to do, though, is no shark bait. I don't think we've ever talked about this before. <laughs> we can capture all of the wallet share. First place you start is with the product. That's just the first nut. This is the Capital Stack. Hey, everybody. This is the Capital Stack. I am your host, David Paul, where we talk to entrepreneurs, founders, operators, and investors about all things value creation and startups. Today, I am talking to Ross Fubini, who is the Managing Director of XYZ Ventures out of San Francisco. Ross, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, David. Ross, you were on the founding team that like discovered the internet, right? Uh, not quite the founding team, but yeah, uh, my first gig coming out of school was working uh, for Netscape way back in 97, 98. Uh, and uh, definitely like Netscape was definitely creating, you know, the, the internet at the time. I mean, it, it, it's funny. It's even to a degree we just didn't realize like Netscape to some people is known for uh, its browser. Some people don't even remember it. You know, the, the first widely adopted internet, internet browser. The thing that was also notable back then is at the time we were creating so many different parts of the internet that we now take for granted. For example, there was a group just down the hall of like four people that, uh, uh, real nice folks. We ended up actually selling, uh, the business. That were the Netscape proxy server, which was essentially the beginning of the CDN business. Now, like, you know, mm. tens of billions of dollars in revenue. And that was just one group. And they sat next to the calendar server, which we thought were going to be a really big deal and weren't. And that group was like, you know, a hop step over from Tim Howes and the LDAP team that, you know, really started the active directory and identity on the internet. So again, it really was a remarkable place to be in because so many things were being invented. You know, the list goes on and on. You know, SSL and cookies themselves is really a tremendous place to be building software. Yeah. So you've had a very long career in software. You look great for a guy that's coming up on what, 30 years in the business? A lot, lot of years. A lot of years. <laughs> is, it, yeah. is it the running? Is that that keeps you healthy? Well, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's definitely a, a, a lot of uh, uh, running and trying to keep up with uh, the latest of, of ideas in addition to just like, you know, not, uh, not breaking ourselves with work, which I know is something you and I suspect a lot of people listening uh, try and manage. So, <laughs> so tell, me, um, tell me a little bit about uh, yourself and, and, you know, emerging from being an operator and a technologist, kind of going into the, um, into the venture wheel world. I think you started your career at Canaan, correct? Um, and a step before that, and actually, so my own background, real briefly, so as, I, as uh, you're, you're, you're kind to mention, my first gig was working uh, for Netscape as a core engineer, and that had been my, my, my training as a computer scientist, mostly because I couldn't hack, you know, real, <laughs> real math and physics. Um, and after that, I was really focused on, ended up working in a, some specific set of uh, networks coming out of the Netscape diaspora. So I worked at a company called Tell Me. Tell Me is a voice IVR company. If you call, you know, help on uh, Fidelity. Now you're still talking to a Fidelity, excuse me, to a Tell Me uh, system that came out of the, um, the Netscape diaspora. Uh, a company called Plumtree, which is really incredible uh, talent pool building sort of early corporate portal software, sort of bringing the, the internet uh, to companies. And again, tremendous sets of networks that came out of that. The CEO of Redfin, the president of Atlassian, uh, many, 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 many ta talented people. Uh, then I ran a division of Symantec, running some stuff at some scale, uh, along with some really, really talented folks. And then I started a company, uh, built that business. Uh, there was basically an enterprise version of Facebook, sold that business to success factors and on to SAP. That was the weird thing for me. This is about 13 years ago now. Um, I then stumbled into venture. I didn't have the grand plan. I ended up with just a phenomenal opportunity. Um, a guy named Mitch Kapoor, Mitch, the founder of Lotus. And if anybody has read things like the power law or anything about the history of venture, Mitch was like truly a tremendous part of early venture. He, he and Ron Conway were basically angels when that was not a thing. And, um, 
to to a huge degree in the case uh, both of them. And so I got to go work with Mitch at Cape Or Capital doing early stage investments. Learned so much from them. This is back when Mitch is doing you know investments in in Uber and then we did Twilio and Optimizely and Clever and Omada Health and LendUp and really some incredible incredible uh, businesses over the years and economics. Um, and then I'm um, you know. Finishing my narrative, I went to Canaan Partners. Canaan's a wonderful uh, multi-stage, multi-sector firm. Uh, worked there for a number of years uh, before then starting um, both uh, uh, XYZ and another firm called uh, Village Global. And now running uh, XYZ is, uh, I don't know, it feels like the, the work of a, the, uh, the dream. I don't know. It's, 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 it's wonderful. It's really just doing my best work and working with the best people. That's great. So before, and I want to hear about the whole XYZ story, um, yeah. Village Global, tell us about yeah. that and kind of, you know, um, you know, the, the concept and, and that, because that was a, a big piece of history as well. Yeah. I mean, Village Global and, um, and, and the present Village Global is a, is a terrific, uh, venture firm running now. And the idea for those that don't know Village Global was really a, so the, this this theme of networks is one that runs through my entire personal history as well as the kind of products I built. And the idea of Village Global is really a network-based venture firm. So it starts with um, uh, Luminaries, Reed, Hoffman, Zuck, Bezos, Bob Iger, Barry Diller, uh, Abby Johnson, many other talented, uh, incredible, incredible uh, famous folks, and then builds an extended network of uh, investors and fund managers and then founders uh, around it. And so it's a really uh, terrific um, firm that I was lucky to be part of uh, putting together along with Ben, Ann, and Eric, the other GPs there. Um, uh, I was running in similar time that uh, I had also started XYZ, the firm that I run now. And they're, um, they're interesting if only for their, their differences. Um, Village runs a really powerful and wonderful broad network, both of those luminaries and founders. XYZ is very, um, in some ways it couldn't be more traditional. We go very deep with a small number of founders. We do that both from an ownership perspective and how we structure our portfolio. We do it from time in and just we, I talk to founders essentially every week, every other week and very, very involved in their company development and then fundraising processes. And frankly, we're also much more narrow. We really focus on specific themes in the public sector, procurement, climate tech, these very narrow, uh, waves of change. Um, but both really exciting businesses, really exciting firms. And I feel lucky to be part of, you know, starting both and running one. Yeah, that's fantastic. So, um, XYZ specifically, you know, got a great, great list of, you know, portfolio companies, one of which that, um, you know, we share together. Um, but it seems, you know, you, you're, you're looking at, you know, enterprise software, fintech, insure tech, public sectors. How did you come across doing those types of thematic works? I know you have some partners. Do you guys just kind of go in the woods and think about it for a long time? How did you come across like those are the things that you want to focus with generationally over the next, you know, 10, 20, 30 years? Yeah. Um, and there's, there's two parts that we think about. The first is the, the networks that we're working in. And then, um, uh, and then what's changing in the industries we like. So the, the first part for XYZ, and this was literally in the original, uh, fun one, uh, pitch is a really, is a deep focus on, uh, my network and specifically the, the Palantir network. So Palantir is a big data company, um, that many people have heard of now. Um, I had, uh, um, been part of connecting the, the first employee to the second, the CTO in the COO currently. Um, and I'm lucky to be part of then the, that business as an advisor to different people and different executives as that company was growing up. So I knew it was just very special the way that some people knew that the early, you know, Facebook network is special or the current, um, Stripe network is special. Maybe the way that the rippling network is going to be special. And so when I was building XYZ, I was disproportionately focused on founders coming out of that network. And so we've backed more than 20 companies now coming out of that network. Some of those businesses, you know, being first money into Andrel, now worth $9 billion, 
It's hundreds of millions of rev in revenue as a new defense contractor. Uh, Hex, which is a new um, uh, data uh, data visualization um, uh, company, uh, which has raised a lot of money and has really been a transformative tool for data sciences teams uh, in Peregrine and Saltbox and just Chapters, new Medicare brokers, like huge numbers. So I think some of it begins with this network focus, and that network is building companies in the fintech and enterprise spaces. The second part of, of uh, my belief of why we've been successful and really what we do is trying to figure out within enterprise and fintech, what's changing in a way that we think you can build really big companies uh, right now. And, you know, public sector is one example. And it's a good one because Palantir did a lot. Well, it's a good one because my own personal interest in history, my grandfather was assistant secretary of defense under Kennedy and Johnson. And so I feel like all of my life, I've just spent trying to earn my, you know, my, my mom's love and respect. <laughs> you and me both. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is the whole thing, right? You're like just, working hard, to like I just trying. want my mom to love me. I mean, it's everything. You know, it's, you know, my mom's never going to get there. It's always going to be like a, you know, you could try a little harder. Yeah. You know, um, years ago when I sold uh, sold the company, I mentioned the success factors. I was calling my my mom as one does, driving to the bank to do distribution. It's actually driving to SVB, mm-hmm. and I'm telling her like, "Oh, doing this thing, it's so exciting." She's like, a little sort of pause. She's like, do you think I could have sold it for more? I'm like, it's not helpful. <laughs> like, it's, like, it's like you got the, the silver. She's like, could you run a little bit faster? Are you, yeah. My mom, you sure you like, my mom would have been like, that's great, honey, but you really should lose some weight, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like a throw up so, in the bathroom, you know? So, uh, <laughs> so and the, 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 you know, seriously, the, the, um, the, 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 the professional aspirations are the same with my, my grandfather. My grandfather, I knew well, he's now passed away. He was this tremendous intellect and, um, did an immense amount for the world through his work, uh, through the DOD. Um, and so I have a, an interest there. I grew up in Virginia, come out of the Bay Area. I did this work with Palantir. And so I was really interested in the public sector because of that, uh, led to the investment in Andrel. Um, and since then, we've done many, many, many other investments that touch regulated areas. And so uh, to go back to your question, like, why this? It's Some is because success is beginning success. Yeah. That is right. you're finding things. Mm-hmm. Some is expertise of the pattern. But a lot of it's like, what's what do we see changing? Um, and some of those are sad things like wars. Uh, yeah. you know, who knew we were going to have a ground war in Ukraine? Um, and some are very clear um uh, emerging patterns on the competition with China, um, and also the need to have more uh, modern um, um, technology adopted across uh, the government sector, from the DoD to Medicare uh, brokerage services. And so, I just I think those are all big opportunities. They aren't super well understood, and that makes them exciting things to go build. As one example, um, and there are others. Um, so there, there, there are others like that in procurement and climate and others we kind of have passions about. They all develop in that same way. Yeah, I feel what you were speaking about is super interesting. And I'm I'm not very intelligent, but like if you were to think about just kind of like innovation and it just seems like all the laggards are catching up, right? You know, mm-hmm. like within healthcare, within defense, like all the SaaS 1.0 kind of um platforms out there. I've just been seeing a lot of things within utilities, you know, infrastructure, you know, security, kind of all those things. It just seems like people are buying software now where they yeah. traditionally have been more stodgy. Uh, yeah, it's absolutely true, but it's all, I'll just remind you, it's all still, it's all still pretty early mm-hmm. in these shifts. So everything you're saying is, is absolutely the case, but still it's a, a pittance of the DOD budget. Um, or let's use another example that's maybe we we're seeing play out, uh, is, is fintech where we spend a lot of time. You're now seeing, um, a lot of the, the banks and established players, uh, catch up in terms of like, you know, is the Chime UI that much better or worse than the, uh, mobile UI and chase? Eh. Right. You know, right. and, and there are many other areas of efficiency that are catching up. That said, this is like what fintech's a, certainly a trillion dollar business globally Mm -hmm. um, opportunities there. But even in the U.S., there's just things that have just not been uh, transformed, uh, period. And and we're still 
Uh, so I think there's there's more to there's more to do. Um, there are parts of the industry where where the opportunity has shifted around. To give you another kind of in the the messy details example, there's several companies that have been built um, on selling new um, insurance and benefit products to large enterprises. Livongo and then Teladoc is maybe a great example. Mm-hmm. Hugely successful company, really figured out how to sell to large enterprises a better set of health services next to their existing, you know, United Health plan. Mm-hmm. That said, that category is now like super well occupied. There are lots of people calling on that customer. There's probably new stuff to do there, but it's, uh, that space is occupied. But I don't think anybody on this listening here, you, me, or otherwise thinks like healthcare is well adopted technology. No. There's lots of stuff to do, but like that, that angle of attack is gotten is, is is now well, uh, well occupied. So you got to go look for, for, for new areas to go. Yeah, I think healthcare is one of those things that during COVID, all the digital health companies, I feel like everyone was just trying to displace provider networks by doing telehealth for X. Yep. And yeah. uh, the the VC community kind of missed the mark on all, a lot of low hanging fruit of like, you know, just tech enabled or SaaS products that could increase efficiencies. I, mean, I could probably sit with anybody for an hour and find some kind of automation or, you know, intelligent solution that could, you know, create savings. Yeah, uh, I agree. It's well. There's what we get. We could talk for hours about healthcare because there's interesting aspects also of it. Is you have to create. You can create savings with technology, but then capturing the savings is hard. I'll tell you. You know, years ago, we had this company um, uh, invested in called Ginger. It's a company still around now. Uh, got quite a bit larger, but when it was first starting, it had a technology that um, was running on your phone. It could tell you if you had depression. And depression, mm-hmm. diabetes were comorbidities. Mm-hmm. And so, if you're running a uh, uh, what's called capitalist care, if you're running, you know, coverage and care for someone with diabetes it's really helpful to know if they have depression because you can give them additional support and keep them from going to the ER and having all kinds of troubles. In theory, a technology that that should get widely adopted. In reality, you can use that technology. You could also just set up a nursing call center. You could do different nursing training. There's like the system is so inefficient that you can actually solve it a lot of different ways. And so technology can be one way, but it's not as blinding versus if you could show like Amazon, you can improve click through rates by like 0.2. They'd be like, great, we're in. We're definitely <laughs> buying it. We'll buy all of it. Yeah, Cause like exactly. the thing has already been compressed so much. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it, that's what makes healthcare but interesting and, and hard. Um, right. To, to go build businesses. Insurance is, is similar. Insurance is mostly about distribution. Um, so we built a company called New Front Insurance. We got to be part of building New Front Insurance, large commercial insurance broker. I think fastest growing, I think, in the U.S. right now uh, among them. And it was really because it was focused on distribution. And we actually didn't try to do a lot of innovation and in how we made that a great customer experience, a great selling experience. But we leaned into the traditional view of commercial insurance brokerage, which is it's sold by brokers, but it so became about superpowering brokers. This was in contrast to all the consumer approaches about insurance from Lemonade and others that were about like making uh, a new, uh, a new uh, experience you're going to buy from them, not from, you know, Allstate or Geico. And there's some reasons that the former is gone well and the latter has been very hard so it's a you know one thing by the way david worth mentioning i think you and i are both drawn to this they're like interesting complex solutions you know of like they require a lot of execution from teams but also like a navigating um na- navigating like these these kind of complex markets so that when you figure it out you can you can really shoot forward and build something that's that's you know wins and is big and fun to build and fun to run yeah, I feel like in software, it's like all the easy stuff has been solved. You know, like you really need to solve yeah. a complex problem to to get really true value, or else it just gets too competitive too quickly. Yeah, the competitive part I think is a huge part of it. Yeah. No one's talking, or people often aren't talking about in like the the SaaS world. You know, so multiples went way up, they went way down. Like right. we could talk all about that, and you're you're wiser on those topics than I am by a lot. Um, inter- like one of the reasons that that's happened is is because it's so much easier to stand up these companies. So you get like so much competition sure. around Martech, or so many, you know, so much competition in you know some area, and this eat all the margin out 
uh, of the business because you can you can get the same thing cheaper if not like you know someone else could just go you know Salesforce can just go build that feature. Your company just go build that feature, totally. and then your business gets worse. Like you know, you just get you know you just get piled on, and people just start you know giving it away. Um, yeah. I really like what you said about thesis driven investment through networks. <clears throat> Being an analytical guy, do you ever think about how to? I guess really think about your network in a in a quantitative way. <sighs> yes. Uh, yes, a lot, and absolutely no. But the absolutely no part is for me, and it's because I, I just, I'm not savvy enough uh, to figure this out. I think a lot of things, I'm just not transactional. Um, mm-hmm. So I think a lot of the best things, that relationship with, with Palantir, mm-hmm. it, just, it came out of accident of me introducing these two people and then really thinking those people were smart, wanting to spend more time with those execs. And that ended up becoming um, significantly economic for me uh, as an investor in Palantir. And then later, it had the benefit of this 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 uh, this extended network. But it really just came from, you know, being interested and being open. Um, so that's the no part. And that's still constant now. Like, I try and always – I'm pretty busy, just like you. So many of us, uh, they're listening. But I always try and make time and, and extend myself – uh, to a, a wide set of people, you know, just for everybody, but like, you know, people that have worked with your companies, people that are always helping you out, people that real, send you thoughtful emails that maybe you haven't even met before and try and be open to that. So that's the absolutely not. I'm pretty sloppy about it because you never know what's going to turn into a good result. The yes part is more, um, actually as a firm, we really focus on founder, on backing founders that are introduced from other founders. So about 50% of our portfolio of companies, and we have 96 in the XYZ portfolio, are uh, founders that we've, our introductions from founders that we've already backed. So if anyone, you know, uh, from our, our, our uh, mutual uh, company uh, sends someone uh, over to, for us to talk to, we always take the meeting and we always uh, close the loop, try and give them feedback. And if it's great, you know, we, we want to invest in that business. And so that's the part that is, it's very, um, uh, um, it is very, you know, data aware, very network aware, making an active process to be that partner, uh, because it's been a, a great way to find investments. Mm-hmm. And do you like on your, do you do any outbound sourcing as well? We do into not that much is the answer. So there are other yeah. great firms like Bessemer that have this sort of ocean of analysts that call fo- folks out. We don't do that much uh, with the exception I mentioned of specific networks. Like we want to see everything coming out of the Palantir network. My uh, partner, Chauncey mm-hmm. Hamilton, uh, used to run the, the dorm room fund, which is an early stage fund focusing on backing people out of uh, colleges, starting companies. Mm-hmm. So we pay a lot of attention to that network. Um, uh, and the woman, Molly, who runs it now, is really tremendously talented. Um, uh, and as I said, our, our own uh, our own network, we, we pay a lot of attention. To, so we're, we're constantly doing that part. The second part that's outbound-ish is I, I believe that venture is just a whole world of tactics. So when things like every time I do a sync with one of our founders, like the last two minutes is me saying, like, you know, if you know anybody else, yeah. Who's really great? We love you know. Yeah, it sounds ask. silly, but like right. if you do it all the goddamn time, like <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, that's like you know, it's always be selling. Everything's always a deal, mm-hmm. and um, you know, we, we've backed. We have a CFO. We were recruiting at one of our companies, and they uh, decided not to join, and they definitely weren't joining. But they were really interesting. So when that process closed, I went and talked to him. I was like, "You're a real entrepreneurial person. Why didn't you join this company?" He's like, "You know." Actually, I'm going to start my own company. I'm like, I am interested in, <laughs> in backing. And then like we, in one, one conversation later, we backed the company. Wow. So nice. that's the, uh, so outbound in that way. It's not, we're just mm-hmm. kind of sitting back here on uh, the golden throne. Yeah. But, uh, but not, uh, but not beyond that. If I could, yeah. if I could do it better, I probably would, but we've never figured out, you know, here's what we believe about climate. How can we take that right out in the world and find people? Right. So, well, no, I like that. If you fail to ask, you ask to fail, right? You always no, got to ask for the next intro. Absolutely. 
So being, you know, in several market cycles, right? Now we're kind of in a down cycle. What, you know, how how are you thinking about things shaping up? I mean, do you feel, I'm not asking you to time it, but, you know, in a situation like this, like what are your general thoughts? What are you telling your portfolio companies? Yeah, um, the, uh, the, so first of all, we're kind of lucky as a firm that we're just not coming from a place of uh, fear. Our late stage stuff is really, is actually quite, quite profitable. Mm -hmm. And, um, our early stage stuff, you know, in other markets, everybody's raised money always. And now some of those companies won't be able to, but that's more normal. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the good fortune of that means that then we're talking to companies, you know, it's not talking to one who's like valued at 4 billion that really has maybe the $200 million of actual value they're creating. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we at least don't have those. Those are, I think, really tough circumstances. They're even tougher if you've got, say, a lot of money on the balance sheet, but you don't know how to take the money and make that value. Mm-hmm. So we don't have that many of those. What we do have um, is, of course, companies are trying to grow through this uh, th- through this market. I think the two things that we're doing a lot is focusing on being appropriately skeptical. So right now we're worried about like what budgets look like, uh, yeah. say in HR benefits. Period. Right. What we yeah. do a lot in CEO. You know, so just you know, being really vivid on you know, everyone wants to hit their number. But are we gonna? Are we gonna hit it? I don't want just want to see a sandbag number, but like it's you know, it's the first month of the quarter. You know, are things closing at the rate we expected? You know, so can we can we look forward and see things are you know going. Are, are going to be worse than we thought, and therefore, what do we do or not? So, there's like more fine tuning, I think, is is one example. This the the second is frankly still um, showing all the growth, but make sure that we can show the showing how the company is growing. So, we have, for example, we have a company that sells very large enterprise, multi million dollar deals to some of the largest companies um, uh, in the world. They they uh, so kind of. Uh, series B company, but it's a kind of lumpy, uh, lumpy revenue business. Um, there's no way really to change that because like, it's big decisions, RFPs, whole process. The thing that they've done though that I think makes the company more exciting um, and lets them show uh, growth and will let them raise a very strong round even in this market um, is number one, they're showing very strong net dollar retention. It's because they're actively going and working with those big brands they already have executed with and basically saying, let's do more with you. Let's go get another million dollars. And th- that's good, period. Money's nice. But also what they're able to show is, is able to show that net dollar retention. So as they go raise the next round of funding, they're not saying just, hey, we get these big brands and they take forever to close, but we're able to expand them. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, really uh, remarkably. And then uh, uh, the second thing that they're doing is they're, they've introduced another product that's actually low, uh, relatively low revenue, but they think is going to sell ubiquitously uh, across their customer base. And so as we came into um, the, the next round of funding, the discussion we had with them is we need to be able to show these two a- attributes, really strong net dollar retention across the whole business, and then show this cross-sell motion with this additional product, and we think we can raise money based on uh, based on that, and so that that won't make that fundraise easy because it's mm-hmm. going to be go, going to raise a C round, and C rounds are really tough yeah, right now. That's a, that's a but tough it means place that company is going to get done. Say yeah. again, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's a tough place to be. Where, where are you seeing around the A's? I mean, are you feeling a little more bullish on those? Yeah, um, I think seeds and A's are happening. A rounds have just generally come down in value. You know, like a mm-hmm. typical A was getting done, I don't know, 100 to 150. You know, mm-hmm. the things higher, higher or lower than that, but, um, you know, generally speaking. And I think we're typically seeing A's get done between 50 and 80. Uh, again, this is valley based company. Everything's going well. Right. And again, they're higher, they're lowers. Um, um, but those are, I think, both the, the the seeds are getting done and the A's are getting done. They're taking longer and higher quality, you know, evidence points, but they're 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 getting done. The later stage stuff, and if you talk to other people that are, that are doing later stage rounds, it's still basically frozen. Yeah, uh, we've actually closed a couple, but they're really the exceptions. And when I talk to those folks and friends of my network, the biggest reason is actually um, number one is the good stuff just isn't in market. People are just like saying, it's a tough market. Why the hell would I go out there at all? 
And then the second thing is somewhat obvious uh, is there's just so much skepticism. Skepticism, I'm like, but the multiple, hey, you said you're going to hit this number at the end of the year. We don't believe you. Like everything is like not measure twice, cut once, we'll measure a thousand times. Okay. Uh, but you can only go out yeah. once. Or like when you go out and you have a broken kind of process, it doesn't look great. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ross, for coming in. Everybody, that's another episode of the Capital Stack, where we're just trying to get a little bit of an edge from a founder perspective, from an operator perspective, and investor. If you like it, subscribe, tell a friend, and we will see you next week. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in to the Capital Stack Podcast. Make sure to share this with someone you know that can benefit from this content. Remember to support this show by rating, reviewing, and subscribing. David Paul is the founder and general partner at DWP Capital. All opinions expressed by David and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of DWP Capital. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for decisions. David and guests may maintain positions in the securities discussed on this podcast.